So remember before we plunge back into this that after vacation you should have read this very important chapter, so important that I can't keep from quoting from it now even though you haven't read it, The Thing in the Natural World. And Sean Kelly will be here for the whole week for both days to talk about it. As I keep saying, he understands it better than anybody in the world, so you're lucky to have him. And then, uh, the week after that, we're going to do the sexuality chapter, which I didn't have in the original syllabus, but Olivier has convinced me it's important, and the price for that is, that uh, the cost of it to him, or the luck for us, is that Olivier will talk about the sexuality chapter and tell us why it's important for the week after Sean, just so you know where we're heading. And for today, I want to talk a while, without interruption, now, because, <laughs> believe it or not, because the issues you raised last time were so important and so complicated and so many, four I think, that it, uh, w w and, so, yeah, and so central to the idea of the book that I want to try to and lay out what I think about them. My email has been buzzing back and forth with Eric's view about it, which I think is wrong, <laughs> Eric, and Olivier's, which I think is closer, but I, I think uh, nobody has got it quite right. And, and, and Rick, I think I have an answer to Rick and the bubble gum under the desk, but all of that takes a little while to lay out. So let's start on 292. Um, it, you've heard this already maybe once or twice, I don't remember how many, but we'll just take this as a sort of text for the first half hour anyway, uh, about eight lines down. My body is geared into the world when my perception presents me with a spectacle as varied and as clearly articulated as possible, and when my motor intentions as they unfold receive the responses they expect from the world. Those are the three things that you're trying to optimize. This maximum sharpness of perception and action points clearly to a perceptual ground, a basis of my life, a general setting in which my body can coexist with the world. That's probably the basic idea of the book. And what we got involved with is a whole bunch of issues around that. So I'm just going to sort of first put that in perspective and then tell you what I think the four questions are that that raises or that you've all raised and that then I think I can now answer. So all the arguments in the space chapter, which you've just read, and I, and I suppose in the whole book, uh, depend on the organisms seeking not just a good grip, but the best one. And uh, now I did say for in my notes, and probably I said it in class, for this task in these circumstances. So that's what I think at least Rick wants me to say. I think that's wrong, and I have, I'll have to argue for that in a minute. Uh, I think it depends on the organism seeking uh, not just a good grip, but the best one. That's right. But it's not for this task in these circumstances. There is one best grip, independent of culture, independent of task. That's what you all were denying and what I was defending, or maybe Olivier was defending it with me, I guess, sort of, half, that's what I thought. But now I want to defend it head on in a minute. So the chapter shows how important the, the idea of maximum grip is for Merleau-Ponty. It's certainly, this we all agree on, necessary for us to have an experience of the size of anything, of, of distance, of motion, of shape, and in the next chapter, it will be also a color, uh, all the constants that go together that make up our experience of a perceptual object. And now the question is, what to do about that? Uh, so we're, I'm going to, um, and, and let's see where I am. Yeah, I thought I would just give one example, one specific example, before I turn to the really general story. Uh, and so let's look, how do we determine how far away something is? Well, do we do it by calculating the, what, the disparity between the, the way how much our eyes are turned in in order to see it? Or that, Merrill Ponty says, no, we don't calculate that. 
Do we calculate it in terms of the distance and the apparent size of the object on the retina? No, because we don't see that and we don't calculate it at all. Something else is happening, something <coughs> entirely different, which he's talking about on 304. But uh, let me say it first, and then I think what, but how far an object seems to us in experience is a function of how much of a grip we have on it. And the, when it's near, then we have the, a good grip on it. As it gets further and further, we get a less good grip on it. At a certain point, where, like when you're taking off in a plane, you, you rather suddenly, though I can't ever get a, get a clear sense of exactly when it happens, you lose your grip on it and then houses and cars look like toys. And you get this too from the top of the Empire State Building. These perceptual constants break down at some point, and that's important because then, it, then, then you do get something like I mean, uh, the retina uh, experience. But normally, you get an experience of something getting further and further away and keeping a constant size, unlike the airplane experience. And but but it's keeping a constant size. But how far away it is it depends on your losing more and more of your sense of what was it, the clarity, the detail, and so forth. So at the bottom of 304, about five lines from the bottom, taking the various apparent sizes of the retreating object, it is not necessary. What? Taking? Yeah. Uh, it, it isn't, that doesn't look like a sentence. Am I being dyslexic? Taking the various apparent sizes of the retreating object. It is not necessary to link them in a synthesis if none of them has been specifically posited. And I guess I should say, uh, in a side, generally I think he's against syntheses because he always thinks that the whole is prior to the elements. Though sometimes he calls the way the whole organizes the elements itself a synthesis. Here he's saying it's not a synthesis of, of elements. We have the retreating object, we never cease to hold it and to have a grip on it and the increasing distance, now we're talking, how do you measure distance, is not as breadth appears to us an augmenting externality, that is what if you get nearer something you can see it getting bigger and bigger in your field I guess, your breadth, but how does depth appear to you because you can't see depth, he says, because it's not spread out in front of you. That's the point. It's, uh, it's, uh, so you can, you can see how far you are from something spread out in front of you. You can see it getting bigger as you get nearer. And, well, not getting bigger. You can see it. That's the point. You can see it as the same size as you get <coughs> nearer and further away. Yet you can see it as nearer and further away. How come? Well, not by a calculation from the apparent size, which stays the same, but from a sense of the grip changing. Now, it expresses that the, the distance that the thing is beginning to slip away from the grip of our gaze and is less closely allied to it. Distance is what distinguishes this loose and approximate grip from the complete grip, which is proximity. We shall define it then as we define straight and oblique that's the part about vertical orientation. Uh, in terms of the situation of the object in relation to our power for grasping it. Now, I'm just putting that in right now as an example. He does the same thing with size and motion. And I'm going to come back to them by the end of the hour if we get time. But because I'm not sure we will get time because I picture although Olivier not being here might make it possible to go further before we launch into one of these big discussions. We may get involved in so many discussions over the four points I want to talk about that we won't get back to it. Well, in that case, too bad, but it's important, more important to get this overall picture. So the perception of the thing as a whole with its thisness and its fullness, remember, is the result of the impersonal body, the imp body schema, locking onto and thereby unlocking the thing in the natural world. That's the overall picture. And that's, and this is what I'm going to argue, the ground of all higher level intentionality. 
which is and it's the thing in the natural world, which is the subject of the next chapter. You can think of what I'm doing when I talk about the next chapter and show you things in it to tell you sort of what questions to be asking as you read it and what to be paying attention to as you read it. And that chapter is so much more central than the space chapter, I think, that it, I don't mind doing that. So here are the four questions to keep in mind as you read the chapter on the thing and listen to Sean talk about it. First, how is maximum grip related to the task? That's the rig problem. Remember the example of the desk. Do I get an optimal grip on the desk just by looking at it in a way that lets me see its shape and its rich qualities uh, optimally? Or uh, how about when I'm looking for bubble gum under the desk? That's not going to be discovered by this general optimal way of looking at the desk. There, there, there's an optimal way of looking at the desk when you're looking for the bubble gum under it. How is that related to the supposed just general optimal way for, of looking at the desk? Or is that just a mistake on my part or Merlo ponties part, if you want? But well, well, first, let's just get Merlo ponty right. Then we'll get the phenomena right. Uh, is there, or is there, as I'm going to claim when we get back to point one, uh, always one basic, natural, optimal grip which is independent of the task. That's the, I'm sure there is. I'm sure I can explain to you how. It's complicated, but it's there. Then the second question is, and how about relative to the culture? Isn't the optimal grip also got to do, reveals the culture, reveals the object as it appears relative to the culture? I think the answer is no. These are all things I was defending last time, and you were all throw, or some people were throwing objections to me, and so I have to answer them. Okay, the third question is, granted you're always experiencing the natural thing uh, in some particular, in, in terms of an optimal, uh, can you ever experience the natural thing alone without any of the task relative or cultural relative properties? There, I think the answer is pretty clear, and I think Olivier quoted the passage. Merleau-Ponty's answer is yes, you can do that. That's the con, con of the wall in, in the Place de la Concorde, yeah, no doubt. And finally, and this is a separate issue that I raised, and this is the one that throws us full blast into the next chapter, but I, I raised it. And so it should be on your mind, and it was certainly on my mind, keeping me awake most of last night, which was the question, do you get a maximum grip, or do you only get a tendency toward a maximum grip? And then people were saying, at least I was hearing, the objection that maybe you never get this optimal grip at all. And I, I was saying, wrong, this time I'm wrong. Three for me and one for you all. Uh, because I was saying there, you have to actually be able to experience the optimal grip in order to be able to experience objects as having a certain size, a certain shape, a certain color, a certain, I always don't remember this list, what is left? It's not a distance that the object has, so that's in there, but it's not a property of the object. Did I, uh, size? Have I left one out? Maybe I haven't left one out. I have to go back and look. Uh, maybe size, color, and shape. Is that it? Oh, that's it. Okay. Where color, of course, stands in for uh, sound and feel and everything. The, the, the whole list of such uh, of what I get with my senses. The sen what is le, le sentir? What was that? How is that sense, sense experience? Um, so that's a very important issue. Do do we ever experience the maximum? And a sub-issue of the same issue from another <coughs> angle, do we need to experience the maximum grip before we can experience stable objects with properties? I said, Merleau Ponty said we do. I now think I was wrong. I think he clearly says we don't, though he also clearly says the opposite. Now, that's, the, <coughs> that's why this is such a hard one. And the moral of this one's going to be when we get there, number four, stick to the phenomenon. Don't 
don't panic. There is a way of getting it all together. Oh, there must be, since there is a phenomenon. Okay. Uh, I, I don't want to discuss anything, but I want to make sure I haven't lost everybody. Is, is, yeah, good, you have a problem. What was question number three? Oh, yeah, well, I went very fast over three because I don't think it's important, and I think the answer is clear. Can we experience the natural thing in a way that is independent of any cultural uh, stance that we have and any task that we have, just in its pure naturalness, which means for everybody who has a body, whether it's a pre-linguistic infant, whether it's somebody in Bali, whether it's somebody maybe medieval, and even primates. Who, I mean, is, there, is there such a way that we can just perceive the thing in its pure natural thingness? That's the third one. Uh, anything else? Okay, let's take them one by one. How is the masculine group related to the past? That's the most fun in a way because that's purely a question of getting the phenomena right. The, let's just sort of see what's going on. The desk has a shape, a size, a color, and feel and a smell, presumably. And Sean wants to add to, uh, to this list top and bottom. That's the orientation part of the chapter, which I'm sort of skipping over. But Sean says there are experiments to show that we experience all objects as having a top and a bottom, or as weird things that we can't figure out where their top and bottom is, but we won't be able to get a good grip on them until we do. I, that's probably true, but I sort of skip that. But we don't need to bring that in. We'll stick to the desk has a shape, size, and color. And there is this, a way in which, oh, oh yeah, here's a, Parentheses. I couldn't resist saying this at this point. Isn't it interesting that shape, size, and color crosses the distinction between primary and secondary qualities? I mean, in case you thought that the, what we were getting here in this list of properties were all relative to us in the same way, they're not. I mean, remember the whole Galileo and mo modernity move that the color is relative to us but presumably the size and shape are just there in the, in the universe. And Merleau-Ponty is not interested in the distinction between primary and secondary qualities because he thinks that, that, that all of them are relative to us and are relative to us in the same way and in a certain way aren't relative to, to us at all because they are really the way the thing in the natural world is. Now, the behind this, which I'm not going to talk about is a question of idealism always lurking on the horizon, which we will get to. But uh, because somehow the thing in the natural world is the way the thing just naturally is, and the, th and the thing in the natural world is the way it is because we've got the body set to unlock it that way. But don't worry about that. Back to what we should be worrying about. Yeah. So if one claims that things are always presented as some deviation from an optimal for us to experience a stable object, then how do we deal with the Rick, Rick objection that the optimal depends on the task? I'm not... Uh, now, the answer is simple, I think, in the phenomenon. You've got to have, I, I don't know what you all think, ask it. I, I, let's take a vote. How many think that there you, you 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 uh, lo you lose the relevance, or you cover up, or you something. The the general optimal. When you have some task which has its own optimal, is that that's how people. You're presupposing that there is a general optimal. Yes. Yeah. Okay. How many believe there is a general optimal according to Merleau Ponty, of an, I'll, a, a, and the phenomena, which I I want to say are always on the same side, uh, and 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 if you do believe there is an optimal. Do you believe that it gets trumped or covered up by the task? I think this is my main contribution this morning. I think I understood something that I hadn't understood before. That, that there's, that's an important question and it has a clear answer. When I go under the desk, which I'm not going to do right now, <laughs> to look for the bubble gum, I, if Merleau-Ponty is right and it feels right to me, I'm going to at the same time feel that I'm getting a very good grip on the 
bottom of the desk in the bubble gum, and I'm going to be feeling at the same time that I'm getting a terrible view of the desk. You're going to be feeling, if he's right, that there is a better way to see the desk, and if you weren't busy looking for the bubble gum, that's where you'd be pulled to go. But you'll, you'll resist that pull toward this better way as long as you've got this task. But the task doesn't in any way override the optimal. Because the optimal is always there as the pull, as the sense that you are not getting the best view of the desk, and it would be better over there, which Merleau Ponty describes as a tension, a sense of unbalance. He, particularly the unbalance comes in when you're looking at the shape of something. There's some shape, he says, I won't rush to find the text, in which you see the optimal balance. And you're going to be getting a very unbalanced view of the shape of the desk under there looking for the gum. And you're going to be always pulled to get the better one and sense that there's a better one. And let me just, and the basic reason why that must be right is that you constantly experience the desk as a stable object with, with a size, a shape, a color, and you do that while going under to look for the bubble gum, even though it's dark under there and the color looks sort of different and the shape is ungodly messed up and, uh, and so forth. The, the object doesn't begin to mess up. Why doesn't the object begin to get unstable and you can't tell what shape it is and you can't tell what color it is and you don't understand, you know, you wonder what size it is. Why doesn't it? Because you're always experiencing yourself as deviating from the optimal while you're doing the task. Now, oddly enough, Eric does not seem happy. I should think everybody would throw up their hands with delight. So when you go under the desk to look for the bubblegum, you get the sense that you have a terrible view of the desk, that's what you're saying. Do you also have the sense that you have a terrible view of the ceiling and of your car and of Paris? No, because you're not trying to see them. That's, I can switch that into this existential point. All of this has got to be sort of existentialized, meaning there's something you're trying to cope with now that you're interested in, and, because you can't be trying to get it's it grip on everything, desk. right? You're coping with the bubble gum, not with the desk. Ah, good. I see what you're saying now. Well, yes and no. I mean, if you could, it's interesting, if you could get so involved with the bubble gum <laughs> issue that that was the whole object and the desk didn't matter. I then I think you're right, Eric. Then, then the whole thing switches over and it becomes a bubblegum issue. But it's not relative. What's relative to the task, I see what you're saying, is what's going to be the stable object and what's going to go into the background. That's, but that's okay. Uh, well, it's interesting. No, I don't know. Stick to the phenomenon. What happens to the desk? if you go under and look for the gum. Um, Why don't you just look under the desk and see what happens? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go ahead. Oh, well, I, I'm so sure that what's going to happen, but I'll go check. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no gum, and that's sure. But, and the desk stayed the same shape and the same color and all that, which is important. And I, how do you account for that? Uh, yeah, I want to say, wait, wait, wait okay, well, uh, well here, Olivia, let Eric first, it's his problem. Uh, I mean, it's on the same. Uh, what? It's on the same problem. I believe it, but I one at a time. Okay, Eric. Well, what? I, I think you... Uh, I mean, I mean, Rick. That's okay. I think uh, your way of phrasing it was sneaky, as Eric was pointing out, because you just, you know, there, there are different tasks involved. So everything that you're saying, I can re-describe in a task-relative way such that we don't need to posit what you're calling, uh, I guess, like a general optimal grip and then the specific one? There's always got to be, I may have described it wrong, let me try again. There's, what, there's some object that you're coping with, and that, and that will be selected by the task. That's what you and Eric are right about. But whatever object is selected by the task, that object's properties are not determined by the task. That object has, and this is where we're disagreeing, and then that comes up next, its own optimal, which is settling what, uh, what color and shape and so forth it has. But, so here's my counterexample. Uh, forget the bubble gum, because you're just kind of playing off the idiosyncrasy of that example. I could just say that, imagine there are different people, an archaeologist's way of studying the table, and the way you would get a maximum grip of the table for his task, whatever complex archaeological task it would be. Then we could have an antique collector who would want a different kind of 
grip of uh, at the table. And then suppose I'm just a consumer and I want to buy a table and I want a sense of whether it would fit in my room or whether it's aesthetically pleasing. I see Even that. Even we're all talking about the table, there, there, there <laughs> still seem to be, you know, there are different qualities of the table we could focus on. That's all. Examining the table, whether or not it has scratches and dings all over, in which case I have to look all around the table. Okay, that's all true. But there is in it, according to Merleau Ponty, and I think he's right, an experience of the table, of which you can look for its scratches and so forth. And just keep your eye on the fact that we're surrounded by objects which have stable shapes, sizes, colors, and so forth. And the, and the, and the Merleau-Ponty claim is that stays constant and is a, done by the body schema in a task irrelevant, person irrelevant, affectivity, that is what you care about and desire, irrelevant way. That's what it means to say that one does it in me, that it's done by the body schema. That's what I'm trying to explain. And that seems the right thing to say, but now, now Olivia, yeah. Well, I think we could leave out this example that because it, it, it uses cultural determinations, but I think even though every object is... But that, 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 begs, that begs the cultural question, actually. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. we yeah, yeah. to see, to say that whatever you do is always task related Because every object just offers an affordance. A what? An affordance. A for yeah. a task. So if you go to the bubble gun under the table, it just means that when you go towards the table, you know that if you want to get the best vantage point on the table, you will stop there. But you don't take this into account. You know that you could, so you, okay, there's this dimension in your experience. And in fact, how is it present in your experience? The fact that would you want to get the best vantage point on the table is that, well, you avoid the table. So you, you just don't go in this position. You know it's here. And this best vantage point corresponds to the fact that you avoid bumping into the table, but you go under it. Oh, I don't and then you get the bubble gum. There, I mean, the, 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 the synthesis of the tasks yeah. that happens when you go for the bubble gum implies that you integrate the fact that you could have been stopping at the table, but you don't do so. You go further. Why is that important? Well, let me even before that, you started with a premise that I didn't get. Uh, it isn't always an affordance. That tree doesn't afford anything to me. But I've got all the same thing. It's got a size and a shape. And yeah, you can kind of think of the cases of utilization behavior, you know? Well, you think that, but I don't want to think of utilization behavior, or if I do, then the utilization behavior is these weird cases where the, the brain injured person, if there's a chair, sits on it, if there's an apple on the doctor's desk, it's it. it. But I don't, I don't have utilization behavior, I don't feel like the thing is, it's very interesting because it doesn't take into account people's desires, precise desires like doesn't, this. right. No, so it's very interesting because it's only Related to the flow of time and the way it integrates oh. partial intentions, oh. partial oh. tasks. Well, I can understand the thing you're saying. <laughs> it shouldn't. I don't believe it that it's related to the flow of time. I don't believe that my experience is that everything is related to the flow of time, of course. But it I mean, happens successively in the flow of time. Of course it does, but I can't believe that that's the issue. The issue is simpler than that. The issue is that we have in us a, a, a kind of impersonal perceiver that perceives objects in an, uh, with Im in an impersonal way, meaning that anybody from any culture with any task will I perceive mean, it. What I mean is natural. You yeah, natural. You don't have to tell them the fact that it's a bantu or, or right. a coming from somewhere. Right, it's natural. Wherever. It comes from anybody. anybody. Of course, I didn't say that. No, I don't did. This is why didn't we bring in time to say that? Well, because that is natural. It's well, yeah, sure, space is a natural, no, or maybe yeah. not. And so what? Can't we separate it from time and say there are natural objects? But what you do is always in time. Yes. If you stick to the phenomena as you propose we do, then you have to take into account the fact that there are intentions. Well, you could stop at the table and you have to notice it. And you have to and notice noticing the table would mean not to go in the direction as to get the best vantage point. Right. But you go under it because there's another task yeah. that presupposes that first you take into account the presence of the table to get the shooting of the under it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be under what? I don't see why. I, mean, I don't think anything you say is wrong. I just want to repeat what I said because I don't think that I need any well, of that. What I mean is that then you can say that the objects are not task related. Task related. That's a term I've already Related. Task related. Task related. Uh, oh, related. Oh, good. Oh, the, uh, good. I was afraid something new was happening. The objects are not related. 
I mean, related to what? Each other, the task, me? The objects aren't related to the task. We agree about that, don't we? I mean, which objects are. I'm dealing with is related to the task. They are related to the task, but it doesn't mean that whatever you want to do just changes the object property. But you don't have to say, I mean, saying that the objects are task related doesn't mean that whatever task you have, it changes the, the object's natural property. Okay, that's what I tried to say when I said which object you're dealing with is task related and, and what you're paying attention to on the object is task related, like the scratch. But the object isn't task related. That's the underlying natural, stable, perceptual object. And that's what correlated with the, co the body schema. I mean, it, keep that impersonal body schema in the background. It's not j there just for fun. It's doing the basic job of giving you a world of objects with, I have to just keep repeating, they have a constant size, this chair, and shape, and color. And that's independent of whether I know it's a chair and a Ford sitting or not on, the, on this Merleau Ponty story. Uh, yeah, James. Okay, I mean, I agree that this is a view that you could have, and I think it could be the right view, but I'm just very skeptical that it's another Pontine's view. Oh, wow. Um, and I have a quote that I'm worried about. Well, that's interesting. There are quotes that kind of dictate this, but not yet. Okay. No, it's back behind. It's on 115. I mean, I don't think that they're... Okay, well, they're not... So it's a quote about the body schema, and what you just said is, is relevant, because it seems to me um, that whatever the optimal grip is going to be, it has to be determined by the body schema, yeah. right? It's not independent of the body schema. It can yeah. just be in the object. Yeah. Well, what about this quote? It's near the bottom, it says, in the last analysis, if my body can be a form, and if there can be in front of it important figures against the different backgrounds, this occurs in virtue of its being polarized by its past, of its existence towards them, of its collecting together of itself in its pursuit of its aims. I don't know what to do with that on this reading here. Well, I don't see the problem. I, I, I think that the task, I mean, again, to stick to the phenomenon, the, the task orients me toward the object, and you, couldn't, you wouldn't be or normally oriented to the object without a task. I think the Place de la Concorde shows you can be. You could just stop your job and stare at the wall. And, but, yeah, but, but this presupposes that you're doing something. Well, you were doing something. You yeah, think you have a task of now? It's an abstract and, and elementary attitude that's no complicated. Well, but it, it, so it means you're doing something because which I think you decide to stop working and to just put it on the task. I mean, it's sort of paradoxical to say your task is not to have any task. I, I one thing at a time. So you've got a task, and your body schema. You know, it says body image, but we all know it's body schema. Is that your is that your body is in the world. Well, the main thing this is emphasizing, I don't disagree with it or anything James said, it's just in a, it got a different issue on its mind. It's that there is always, and that's why this is hard to talk about, normally the body is, uh, is engaged in a task and it's got in, in a culture and all that is involved in being in the world because Merleau Ponty is, if anybody in the world is, a holist through and through. And that's right. And yet, within this holism, there is this claim that the fundamental structural ground of our perception of objects that we share, and we're back again, with creatures that don't have our kinds of tasks and so forth. And that's not incompatible with the fact that we normally do see objects because of our interests. But they don't, and this is crucial for him, they are going, there's a certain level at which they look the same no matter yes. what our I mean, Yes, that's the crucial point. You can't, because on the point of view of the body, I mean, unless you have very strong neural disorders, whatever, I mean, the, 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 the interests of the body uh, tell you what to do, I mean, what you're going to be interested in doing with such or such object. object or why you're interested in knowing that there's a whole down under the table. But the fact that you have different interests, maybe, to look at the bubble gum under the table will change the color of the bubble gum itself, right? I, I just don't see it. I mean... Wait, 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 wait. I want I do not need... Sorry about this, but I... I I think we have to go on for a minute. We'll come, we can come back to this, but we can't, we're not getting any, we're not going to get any further with this, and we're not going to get my four points done if we don't stop for, the, for a while talking about it. So I'm just going to say again what I said, and then we can all come back to it later. 
So I want to say that, I, I mean, and, and I see now that mine was, my wonderful solution was too simple. But when I said that we have two tasks at once to keep the, sta the table stable and the bubble gum stable, that didn't solve the problem, right? The problem is supposed to be, has to be solved in a harder way when you just concentrate on something, either the bubble gum or the table, and you see, and you, under, and you see, I guess Meryl Punky wants to say, that no matter how much you're tasked of dealing with it, what you're going to do, whether you, what, what you're thinking of, what you desire about it and care about it, is no matter how much that varies, and no matter how much your culture varies, and this is clearly his claim, there is an impersonal one who's in your body, which is seeing it just the way that any other one would see it, even primates and so forth. That's the claim. And what always amazes me is how hard it seems to be for anybody to accept this. To me, it seems just incredibly obvious that, that we perceive the same way as all sorts of things. I, remember, I just remember, and maybe this is relevant, a brilliant professor at MIT, famous once, Jerry Lepton, who wrote the famous paper, What the Frog's Eye Tells the Frog's Brain, uh, who found a, the first to plug into a particular neuron and see that it was firing when there was a black spot in the visual field of the frog. But, but let them said, uh, in another context, how amazingly cross-species perception is. And his example was sort of interesting. He said that in order to look, to, to say being eaten, the viceroy mana, uh, butterfly who gets evolves to look like the monarch butterfly, which tastes bad. And it looks that way to the birds. And it looks that way to us. We can't tell viceroys from monarchs, and neither can the bird. That's an example of how cross-species perception is. It seems to have the same, I don't know if it has the same size and shape and color for the bird as it does for us, but it certainly has the same shape and size and color. At, uh, and it isn't really identical to the viceroy. I mean, these two butterflies don't look so much alike that you couldn't tell them apart. They just manage to look enough alike so birds can't tell them apart. And if you know how to look, you can tell. So that's important. Uh, that, uh, what's important is that they look a lot alike to birds and to us and fool the birds. Uh, what, what I want to say about this is that Merleau-Ponty thinks it's just obvious that perception of objects, of their shape, of their size, and of their color goes way across species and absolutely across cultures and castes. And why do you all find that so strange? I, and I have to keep citing the, the, the body schema one, the one that sees in me, the one that sees in me sees in the birds, too. I mean, that's, that's the Merleau Ponty picture. Yeah. But don't you seem to think that it's a task to keep the table stable? Would no, I don't think it is because of the body schema. It would be a task, but the, because the body schema has in it the knowledge of the world and is always knowing how far we're deviating from the optimal. The body, the, the, the desk or the bubble gum or the butterfly stays stable. No? Yeah. Okay. I want to go on. I don't see a problem there yet. Although I see the problem that I haven't convinced anybody yet. But there are plenty. You mentioned two terms that yeah. I think are worth mentioning. Um, I've mm -hmm. heard you mention a little across the account of attention and motivation. I try to not mention them. Uh, yes. Do you have any reason for not mentioning them? I mean, I think they're integral to this, this problem. I think they are think not integral to this. Yeah. And why? Because intention and motivation are individual, so they can't be in the one that thinks think and sees in us. What? You don't, you don't think the attention and motivation are pre-human um, notions of no offenses? They're pre-human, all right, but you have your attention and motivation, presumably, and I have my attention and motivation, whereas your body schema and my body schema is something that takes chairs or tables or trees and gives them the stable shape and stuff, independent of any particular person's particular attention and particular motivation. Would that, would that be getting too optical and how to get into Well, no, it would be just getting non-impersonal. Uh, okay. I mean, there is an impersonal thing in our body, and it has anything to do with our interests, our agency, our tasks, and our culture. That's what he says. I, I want to per convince you both that he says it and that he, it's right and that it doesn't really violate anything you want to say, that on top of that, so to speak, you will also see this 
as uh, an object with a certain use if you belong in this culture and you will see it as, uh, okay, but I haven't got the culture, but that's a good transition. Bert, can I ask a question about birds? Yeah? Because it strikes me that uh, a lot of birds, for example, um, birds of prey, have much, much better vision than we do. They that's can right. see a little tiny mountain way up high in the sky. Wonderful. So how can the optimal grip for a bird be the same as what it is for us? I mean, it has to be at a very different distance. Ah, it doesn't say that the, it's the same, uh, but that's interesting. I think that's interesting and important. We've got to get clear now. When I say that it's an impersonal one and it's the same across all uh, the cultures, I, I mean not that they've got the same ca perceptual capacities. Well, they're just ours. concerned by the maximum grip as well. That's what? All. They're just concerned with, with, with a maximum grip for exhibition. That's right. I want to say their in, impersonal body schema has a better uh, optimal visual component than we do. It's impersonal across all cultures that there will be an optimal visual component. But it, and you're, of course you're right, it's not going to look the, the same. So the, the, the stress should be, you're correcting something I said. I see now, a mistake I make it, sort of. Uh, the, the correction should be on the impersonal, not the cross-cultural. By that I mean the important thing isn't that uh, the one in us is the same as the one in the ego and so forth, that's cross species. The important thing is that the one in us has nothing to do with our interests, our desires, and our tasks. And the one in the ego will have nothing to do with its interests and its desires and its tasks. And I think they will have a lot of global gestalt qualities in common. But that's not the important thing to stress. The, imp the impersonal thing to stress is that there is a way that every species that perceives objects at all perceives them in a way independent of their tasks and interests, not that they all perceive them in the same way we do. Though I don't know how much, to, how far to go with that, so I but won't the go. The thing is, it doesn't even imply to take into account the ego's body, his precise visual system. You have to, eventually. No, you don't. Know. Why? Well, yeah, he can see, okay, but the, the thing he can see better than us isn't important. Well, that he has this tendency to hold the maximum grip. That's true, and I think maybe now that Olivier backs me in the other direction, I feel like a ping pong ball in this discussion. I mean, because he wants to say, he wants me to say, and that's true too, that there's this natural object, and in a certain way, the, e the ego is just getting a better look at it from a farther away thing than we are. I think Merleau Ponty, and that's back to the butterflies again, it, 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 it may be, I mean, it is the same rabbit looking just like a rabbit from the top that he sees from way up there and it's got the color it's got. Now maybe eagles are colorblind. I don't know if they are, then they just don't see a certain aspect of the, of the natural the thing that we do. It's, it's, still the, the same rabbit. it's still the same rabbit with the same shape and the same size and some color or grayness that, that this eagle is seeing. That's, so it is cross-cultural a lot. Maybe I gave too much away. Anyway, the yeah. Quick question. Um, so the this notion of the impersonal one in your body is that, is that so the actual object is that irrelevant? So if it's human, a human body or a human being versus an object, is that, is that irrelevant? irrelevant? Irrelevant at this stage of discussion. That it will also, if it's a human, automatically draw on something in your system which may be in your visual system, in your brain, in your, in your way, in your being in the world, depending on what set level, which makes you unable to not see it as a person. That we'll get to in the chapter on being with others. But people also have a stable size and color and uh, shape and uh, so forth. And it doesn't override that, that you see them as people. They don't stop looking like stable objects of perception. That's the same point again. Well, that, and it's the cultural. Well, it's related to the, more like the cultural point than the past point. But it's probably another, you could probably add a, a fifth point. And not only is this perceptual object and the corporeal schema unaffected by the past, it's also unaffected by the culture. And it's also unaffected by whether the 
object is a human being or an object, or uh, that I, I think, but I have no no word about that. When you when we read the being with others chapter, let's keep that in mind. Uh, there's no doubt that it makes a big difference to see it as a person, but I don't think it makes a difference in the impersonal body schema to see it as a person. It's just another object for the impersonal body schema, I bet. Um, okay, relative to the culture, I made up an example, and maybe it's going to backfire on me like the bubblegum one did, because I was trying to find, and, but there must be something right in what I'm saying, but I don't know what it is yet. I'm trying to find this double thing where we're both responding, I tried to say with the, to the task and the feeling always nonetheless the tension toward the optimal that keeps the object stable. Try this in a culture, I mean, uh, where the, you can have all kinds of differences, but I just take, take an extreme difference what, how you deal with sacred objects in the culture. And I'm making up a story, but I think it's probably true. You're not supposed to go too near the Torah, and you're certainly not supposed to touch the Torah, so you've got to stand at a respectful distance from it, and you would, and you will if you're in the Hebrew culture. But it seems obvious to me that you will feel that you would get a better look if you could go closer, and a better, even better uh, grip on it if you could t t take hold of it. And uh, that isn't, that's not incompatible with the sense that uh, it's the kind of thing that is sacred and you can't come near it. I don't, I think you have these two things at once. And why would you have to have these two things at once? Because the Torah doesn't stop having a shape and a size and a color and a, and a weight that's constant, put you put weight in there, uh, uh, that's constant whether it's got this higher order sacred thing that, 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 that inhibits you from actually getting a better grip on it. Because, and I want to say, that because the crucial thing is that the impersonal body schema isn't committed to getting a better grip on it. It's just committed to feeling unhappy when it doesn't have the optimal grip on it. That is, it feels the tension, it feels the imbalance, it senses that it would be better, he could get, it could be, have a better grip on the object from closer and over there and so forth. But that can be overridden. That doesn't change anything that that can be overridden. Uh, yeah, Eric. So, um, in this Torah example, you say the body schema feels unhappy? Yeah, that's, that's, so so that's the wrong way to put it? You don't, you don't like it. No. You don't like it. Equilibrium, that's all. You feel a disequilibrium. Yeah. Yeah, okay. when I said unhappy, I just meant attention. Attention, you can say. A disequilibrium. What? Happiness is emotion. Oh, well then. I was a metaphor or something. I don't, and I, I don't take me literally. I didn't think that the impersonal body schema was sort of getting out an impersonal <laughs> handkerchief and <laughs> wiping his eyes. Yeah, go ahead. So then, um, the, the characters go a little bit. So then, in the direct event that is in the, at the Torah, um, and you keep this, uh, this, this secret distance from it, uh, take for instance, then um, you say, at the same time, you still feel some disequilibrium. Definitely. You feel that you could see it better from over there, and everything else being equal, you'd rather be over there. That's already putting a little too much personal stuff in it. I can say that. You'd rather, everything else being equal, you'd rather be over there because you're just having, it, it makes you uneasy because you're sort of, it's sort of blurry and so forth. And this is something you, you can experience consciously. Well, you could. I think you'd be too busy looking at the sacred Torah to worry it's, about it's it. It's a constitutive thing. It's a part of the fact that it's sacred because we present it's sacred because you're not completely, you're not allowed to go further to see better. Right. So but, okay. You but you're always feeling, and, but how conscious you are, I guess, uh, of, you know, this disequilibrium is a whole other question. I, I don't know how to describe say what to say about that. Again, it's a possible paper topic, I imagine. It can be very unnoticed and in the very much in the background. I'll read you a quote in a little while where Merleau Ponty says it's in the background. And so you're not noticing it or paying attention to it unless for some funny reason, uh, you, you know, it's breaking down or you're like, you're, you know, the, well, anyway, normally it's in the background. And, yeah. 
I'm puzzled by this example because I think that in the Torah, if the maximum good of that object is keeping the tension, so that you looking at, I mean, you don't uh, realize yourself as getting closer to getting a better grip on it because the object as itself is to keep it you you distant. Yeah, but that's not a disagreement. That just says no, so you, you, there is no, you have no feeling that you no would the one. You said, oh, but I would get a better grip on it if I'll touch it. No, there is no, the, the maximum grip on it is from a distance. Well, that's, that, that just doesn't oh, feel right to me. Yes, but the, the person who can see more, obviously, if one says, okay, what's, it, what's in there, you can see the reason No, if it's an object of yours. Sup it's suppose you put it. Suppose you put it in a very dim light. You want to get the light brighter. You're allowed to do that. Suppose you had to watch it from way down there, but you were allowed to get up this close, but not closer. You want to do that. Uh, suppose you were allowed to carry around the Torah on Simcha's Torah when you have a right to carry around the Torah. You feel, wow, now I've really got a grip on it. So I think the other one is still in the background. Uh, think about it. We talk about it more. Yeah. It seems like in this case, um, the, the, um, the cultural uh, idea, the best cultural situation, um, depends on there being a um, best bodily situation, which is independent of it. Because, the, um, because it, it's in that, you're not reaching the, the maximal well, you get this people have bodily speed of where trouble with the bowels. Right. So it, it seems to be in that you're not reaching the maximum body scheme of red. Right. That will be respectful to, to right. the object. Right. So it, it does, it, it depends on the. the, the uh, that's what Olivia was sort of saying, yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it, that is sac sacred, is, is part of it is that it blocks your natural tendency to get that, closer. That couldn't be. What? That couldn't, it, there couldn't be that dependence of the sacred on the, on the, uh, the body. If, if it weren't, if there was a body. If it weren't the fact the body scheme was actually independent, so cultural. Oh! The punchline was surprising. Go ahead. So, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's in support of your claim that the, the, the body scheme awareness has to be, um, has to be independent. Ah, I see, I see. Yes, good. Otherwise, yeah. um, if it weren't independent in that kind of way, then the, the, the then objects the, are, they'd the, be done conflict. That's right. Then, 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 then the sacred taboo or whatever you know, wouldn't yeah. work. It, it's got to block your tendency to want to pick it up. Yeah. Um, could you say that maybe your personal motivations kind of in a way, well, the personal motivations are certainly affected by the culture and so your attention can shift. They're blocked by this impersonal, what am I trying to say, this impersonal ability for maximal grip is being blocked by these personal motivations in this case that are affected by the culture. Yeah. You know, uh, this, uh, I like to think of it in terms of this impersonal ability for maximum grip. You don't have to fulfill this maximum That's grip right. every time. But you have to feel. I mean, have to because it's this, this impersonal thing happening in you that you, this tension, this disequilibrium, this unbalance, this pull to see it from over there. You can then override the pull by this cultural thing. I can just thing. violate the sacred uh, law that says I should not be right. close to the Torah. That's right. That's right. Well, that's what, that's what we're all saying. I think that we're agreeing about that. Maybe, I don't know if you're not, you might not be. But Do you think that's a good way of putting it, though? Like your personal motivation, in a way, blocks this impersonal ability for a maximal grip in this case? Yes, but it, it, it blocks doing it, but it doesn't block, it can't, because this impersonal body is right it's on saying, ability. boy, this is, a, uh, this is a tension. I mean, how clearly it says that, I don't know. This is an optimal. You'd be better off if I were over there. But, yeah, uh, and you block. The, the personal motivation causes your attention to shift such that you don't fulfill this ability That's for a right. personal you don't, uh, so, But I keep wanting to stress because it's going to turn out to be very important later. It isn't just uh, that you, you just don't fulfill it. The important thing to stress is that you still feel it. I mean, the, the body schema goes right on saying this is an unbalanced, this is a disequilibrium, this is a tension. Uh, yeah, I would be pulled to go right. over here. Yeah. Okay. So this is what this is doing. Yes, that's right. That's what distance is, he says. It's the, what, the, the sense that I'm not as, I'm not as close as I uh, would like to be. That's what distance is. And where close means getting a better grip, where, where the impersonal body schema could get a better grip. Uh, okay, James and then Eric. Question. I mean, would you say that the optimal grip on the Torah would be the one in where you could see the whole book really well or where you could read the writing? Ah, 
Yeah, interesting. They use, they, use, they use it as a puzzling things like the bubble gum. The optimal grip on the Torah, depending on whether you were interested, I guess, and now it will out interested. Uh, but, but, okay. Her, her, her point is that if you're interested in being respectful, no, the, optimal grip, the optimal yeah. grip is to be... No, it's, no, it's the bubble gum it's example. No, it's just... No, no, it, no, no, I'm, just I'm, I'm trying to go below the level of culture and just right. say... Yeah. It, yeah, it's, that's, it's the bubble gum. It's the shifting task example. But, again. I'm saying there's but, a level. but there's only one thing there. There's no. We're not talking about bubble gum, which is a separate object. There's only one object. Okay, good. You're making it harder. You're, 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 you're turning up the the temperature on the up on the bubble gum example, which makes it even harder for me to cope with it. I see that that's right. Uh, I don't know where this will lead, but I think you have to say. Stick to the phenomena, remember, that it's, it's the case that you may be interested in the whole object and its beautiful case and all that, and then you will feel that you uh, can't get closer and you shouldn't get closer and you're really seeing it as well as, you, as it requires to be seen when you can't get closer, but you'll feel all that anyway. But now, suppose you're trying to read it. Well, it seems to me that we never said that you aren't directed by your task now, it's just, I still think it's like the bubblegum example, basically. Now your task is to read it. Well, it's got a perceptual page with perceptual print on it, and there's an optimal distance from that. And that doesn't mean that your task has changed the impersonal body schema, which will do the job for you if your task is to see the whole object. It'll do the job for you if your task is to read a page of the object. It'll be, so it's okay, I think. It, does, it doesn't challenge the basic well, I'm trying to challenge the idea that there is such a thing as an optimal grip, and forgetting about tasks. I mean, yeah. it seems to me the writing on the inside yeah. and the total shape yeah. of the object yeah. are both equally essential to its being the object that it is. And I don't think there's any neutral way of describing that one of those two standpoints, one from which you can read and one from which you can see the whole thing, is superior to the other. There's yeah. an optimal grip on whatever is the figure, I think, in your experience. And that happens mostly, or maybe always, to be a function of the task. And no, it probably shouldn't say that there's an optimal grip on the object. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And that's right. I mean, because you can certainly get inside the object. I mean, you get an ultimate grip on a house when you see it from, a, from the front, and another optimal grip on the house if you see the interior and the furniture. So we shouldn't say that there's an, just one optimal. But again, the phenomena says, OK, the important thing is that there's an impersonal body schema which will kick in and stabilize your perceptual experience of the inside of the house or the outside of the house. So we better not say an optimal grip on the house. We better just say your task will determine something as figure for you. And at that point, your optimal, the optimal stuff in your impersonal body will take over and stabilize it. Is that okay? So it is relative to the task, but not in the way that we oh, yeah. live in right. our Right, right, right. Good. We're sorting it out. It's relative to the task. What is the figure? And that's part of the existential being in the world aspect of it. But it's also your body has an impersonal task, namely getting an optimal grip. And it's also relative to that. And that's also called existential and being in the world. Yeah, right. So along these points, it seems like the... On the one hand, maximum grip is supposed to accomplish the dirty work of preserving constancy. Yes. And so no one wants to deny that we experience constancy, but you have to distinguish between the constancies that are in the background as opposed to the constant as opposed to the maximum grip of the particular object that I'm paying attention to and is the object of my task. And so and so all we can only shift our tasks and no but no one is saying that when you shift tasks that the background constancies disappear. It's just that uh, even though, so I don't have a sense of the colors um, around me changing when I'm shifting tasks. But then there is a problem of getting a maximum grip of the color of this one object. So, right. so there's an example of buying a tie in unnatural light. And then and to really get a maximum grip of the color of this tie, I'm really just looking at it and looking at it next to different things. And then I go outside in sunlight. And then really in the sunlight, you know, if ever That's there were right. a maximum grip of the color yeah. of this That's object. That's right. But and so so even with even though I don't experience the, the object is changing color, so even when it's in the background, there's the color constancy. There's still a sense of the maximum grip of the object in the periphery, in the background, and the maximum grip that I experience. That's absolutely right. And I'm going to take that up 
Is there either two? Is that it? Yeah, that's point four. That's because that's related to the issue I said that was, in, was important, whether you ever needed to get the, the at maximum grip. And that really, this is, a, this is the question of whether the, the true color is, needs ever to be something you see. Maybe you can't get any red light to see it in that. that that's a separate question, though. Well, for, now, I, for now, I just want to emphasize how it seems like there are two kinds. Of, there's a background and a foreground. And, well, and I, I guess I have a question. Though. On your understanding of maximum grip, is there maximum grip happening all the time, and that's what's preserving constancy? The, the, yes. the sense of deviation of norms? Yes. And that's in the background. That's why we have all the constancy. Yes. But you also would accept, if we just look at the phenomenon, that sometimes we are engaged in a task where we want to isolate a particular property of an object. Yes. And in that case, it seems like that would be, for you, that would also be a case of maximum grip. Like the painting. Mm -hmm. yes, example, I see what you're saying. You have to think about it. I'm looking at a painting. Are we forgetting the distinction between maximum grip and optimal grip? Optimal no, grip? I don't think so. I think they're the same. I don't think that's going to help. What Rick is saying is, Further, there's, there's a new interesting issue there. There are all these interesting issues. What that interesting issue is, is that the Merrill Punch is quite clear, but I won't go and try to grab the page and read it, that the optimal grip is a kind of optimal that takes into account various factors and kind of does a Pareto optimal on them, if you know what that is. I mean, it tries to find the position in which you get the most of all of them without getting all of any of them. And uh, now Rick is saying, yes, but you could shift that too if your interest changed, where instead of trying to get the optimal that gets the best uh, combination of seeing the texture, seeing the size, seeing the color, seeing the shape, that you just put them all into trying to optimize one of them. That's what you're saying. Yeah. And you could do that. And what about that? Well... And that doesn't destroy the constancies in the background. So that's right, and, 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 your, and your impersonal schema is going to go on anyway. That's just a, a refinement, but it's an interesting refinement. Yeah. I don't see why the um, Griffin or the William Clark, the, the cultural significance of what we see and the natural significance of what we see. Um, I think, like, you shouldn't be privileging like, the natural, um, or natural perception of things as natural things. As when you're talking about maximum grip, you need to take into consideration um, human significance is your human disrespect to our being in the world because it includes it includes all these cultural and human significances and that that lies above everything else, all the biological stuff, all the natural stuff, all the spatial stuff and and um yeah. Well yeah, I mean, I see what you're saying and I just want to say for Merleau Ponty, that's interesting and he'll get there. And then he gets to the freedom chapter and the others and so forth. There he is, so to speak, on top of this basic level, okay. all these other, and the basic level is not trans... Basic level, you're calling it the, the future, the, the impersonal one, this basic level is still a human, if you're perceiving as a human, it's going to have the human aspect to it. Well, now that's the, that's point four, but we might as well skip to it because we're going to get it out of the way in a hurry. Point four is, yes, most of the time, this thing looks if you're in a Christian culture as a creature of God, and if you're in Homeric Greece, it looks like something that whooshed up, and so forth. There's, there's a different way things look in each culture, and, and all kinds of differences. And Merleau Ponty thinks that, given his t sort of top down holism, most of the time, it's already got not only this impersonal list of stuff, which I get tired of repeating, yeah, but it's also got the perceptual, uh, it, it looks like a creature of God, or it looks like something that washed up, or it looks like something that needs nurturing if you're in, in uh, Athenian Greece, or it looks like subjects and objects if you're, if you're us. Uh, that's true, all right, and, uh, but all of, but Merleau Ponty wants to say two things about that. One, that that presupposes as its basis that you get a stable perceptual object at first, and then without that you can't have it looking uh, like a creature of God or anything else. Second, and this is this funny passage which I said I would get out of the way in a hurry, is the Place de la Concorde comment. I'm going to just skip to it because uh, that will, I just want to do number four when the time comes. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you see, it, well, first he goes through, he goes through two steps. He says, first you see, it, this is a stone, and then you can see it just as like the colors. And the good, good, and yeah, yeah. So um, he's just making the point that all of this is like underlying the cultural significance. That's right. We have it all; it's all there. Yes. But 
That's right. And you, I don't know what you're saying, except probably that the cultural significance is important. And not only is it important what we share with the higher primates and maybe the birds, but it's important that what we share with all human beings, and even more, it's maybe very important what we share with the people in our culture. I, that's fine. That's what, but what interests him is, to, because he's writing the book, The Phenomenology of Perception, to get this clear about this impersonal body schema level. And this isn't just because he happens to be interested in that, but he thinks that that's fundamental in the sense that if you don't have that, you can't have the others. And you could have that without having the others. That's just what the wall is supposed to show. It's a philosophical point, not that the gritty wall in the Place de la Concorde is supposed to be as interesting as, uh, you know, the book. But that, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relation of founding, as Husserl would call it. That is, you can't have any of these others without having this perceptual one. You can have the perceptual one without having the others, although that's a weird case. And you should know that, and it should be philosophically important that there is this basic level. Yeah. Um, coming back to your um, reaction on, on Rick's uh, um, point of the foreground background, because I think it's important. Um, so if you say that you get a maximum grip on the figure, then I think you mean that you get a maximum grip on, on a gestalt, which is not the same as getting a grip on an object. Maybe, then I shouldn't, we shouldn't maybe say it the way Rick said it, but the phenomena is we can pick out and put as a figure on a background some particular natural property of the object, the tie in this case, namely its color. And we do that by focusing on the color and trying to get the optimal for seeing that color, even if the shape of the tie doesn't turn out to be important anymore or the texture or the material. That, and, and those constants will be in the background in the sense that we're not noticing them. That's all he wants to say. Now, well, let, me, let me go on. I, they're so, because there's one big, really important issue we haven't even gotten to, or maybe two. Let's do the culture first. I've got, I think I finished that. Good, I finished that. Uh, and we've done the wall in the Place de la Concorde. Let's say we finish that. Uh, can you, that was number three. Can you experience the natural thing alone without any relevance to the task and so forth? Merleau Ponty's answer is yes. And that's important mainly because of this notion of foundationalness. Uh, now, there's another whole big important issue with it that I raised and it's been in the background of this discussion, but we've got to get it into the foreground. So I didn't worry too much about the time because it's something that Sean is a, a specialist on and it will come up again. But I think you should start thinking about it. Do we need to experience the maximum grip to experience stable objects as having a constant size and shape and color? Because we can only experience this constant if we experience the current one, the current way it looks, as deviations from the optimal. See the problem? Don't you have to know what the, what the thing looks like at its best, so to speak, in order to experience it as not as clear as, or as it should be, that I get a clearer view over there, that I could see this shape better from over here, that I could, and so forth. Don't you have to have already had an experience of the optimal, maximal, whatever, I think there's no difference there, the optimal uh, uh, look of it a look of it in which you don't feel, let's describe that optimal, any tension, any unbalance, any pull to be anywhere else or, or to, you know, change the lighting. The lighting is just the right brightness, the lighting is just the right color, you're just the right distance and it just feels fine. You can have such an experience, but do you have to have such an experience to get the sense of deviation from it? Well, that's a tough one, but the answer has got to be no. Uh, because it would have weird results otherwise. It, it, somebody, if you just didn't happen to have ever had the optimal experience of the such and such, you couldn't have a stable uh, experience of the such and such. Uh, but then you get this funny question, but how do you know what the optimal is if you never had an experience of it? So that you can understand, feel your present experience is not as good as it could be. I guess the answer to that is supposed to be, and that's why I think it's so interesting and important, the impersonal corporal schema knows somehow 
it's got in it a whole understanding of the world already. And then therefore, it's got an understanding of what this object would look like from the optimal, even if it's never seen it from the optimal. Olivier is not an encouragement. Because it seems like an outrageous thesis. But I think Merleau-Ponty would just say, but look, that's how it has to be. Because we know that people can experience stable objects with stable shapes and properties and colors and all that, who have never seen them under the optimal conditions. And therefore, we can know that our body schema has already got built into it this prehistory, before we were ever born already, of an understanding of the properties of natural objects and how they would look from wherever, even if you've never seen them from wherever. That's built in. It's amazing. And true, probably. Yeah. I must say, in general, we're reviewing the norms. Just norms, to, right. To suppose that we have to represent the goal. That right. We're aiming. Right. It seems like we're supposing that we have to represent the, the ideal situation. That's right. And that seems, um, in general, when we talk about norms, um, uh, we think that um, we, uh, we, 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 follow, we follow a rule uh, and, and, and try to get things right without uh, necessarily representing uh, what the rule is or, or, or what it would be to get it right. Is that what you mean? Is it what, what it would be? Do we have to have a description or an experience of what it would be to get it right? We don't seem to need a general description of what it would be to get it right in order to be, to be governed by, by norms that tend to make it sense towards getting it right in general. Right. But uh, and I'm not sure we're saying the same thing. But let me say what I think is, to me, the important thing. Uh, wh where am I? Let's see. I see, I, it took pages to say it, but I'm going to try to do it in brief because Sean will do it anyway. Uh, so this is, by the way, what I'm telling you now is the sense in which the body contains the logos of the world, the key for unlocking all experiences, even before you've had it. And the point is that you don't need to experience the maximum grip. What you always experience is the more or less deviation from the maximum. And thanks to the way the body schema already under has an understanding of the world, it gives you an answer that this is the best, or it could be, it would be better over there. It gives you attention, or, or and sense of unbalance, or it doesn't. I was just wrong when I said that you had to experience the maximum grip in order to experience the constants that they that are related to them. Uh, it's just not so. And the clearest quote for where it's not so is on 356, which Sean picks out and makes a big fuss about. And I'm going to refer you to that. It just a sentence. I don't know if the real color. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, it's about five lines down. The real color. But t take Rick's story about the tie and the fact that you may never have seen the real color, in the sense that, only in this peculiar sense now, that you never see the color under optimal conditions of lighting and nearness and head onness and all that. Uh, but yet you've seen the real color. You saw the real color all along. Because the real color isn't the color that you experience when you see it optimally. The real color is what is in the background giving you the experience that all the experiences you've had of that color so far are not optimal. It gives you the sense of, I could see it even better from there and see it even better from there. Just to have that experience is already to, that is to see the real color. You never have to see the optimal color in order to sense deviations from the optimal. And as long as you're sensing deviations from the optimal, you're seeing the real color. This is said on page seven, no, sorry, line seven of 356. The real color persists beneath appearances as the background beneath the figure. That is not as seen as a seen or thought of quality, but through a non-sensory presence. Well, the non-sensory presence is the tension, is the feeling of unbalance, is the sense that I could see it even better over there. As soon as you've got that, you've already seen it. You already have seen the optimal color. I don't know how that's going to work with the tie, but it's supposed to work with the tie. Doesn't this suggest, rather, that you don't actually see the real 
color, that the real color persists, and then non-sensory is present. Well, that's right. That's good. That's important. Yes. So it's like okay, good. Now, now you made the right distinction. The, the complication. I, I've not. I mean, I'm trying to say everything at once, and that's a problem. There's the real color in the sense that we that, that, that is tied up with the optimal grip story that counts for all the deviations is a color that you never see. It's like the magnet underneath sucking you in. Right. It's what is it, the, the nearest you come to ever seeing the real color is seeing the color in a way that you don't feel any tension anymore. Now that's see there are two senses of optimal color, seeing the color because you can see the color, the red tie, in the optimal conditions. And that means when the lighting is right, and that means basically when you don't feel any tension and, uh, and, and that there's any place from which you can see it better. Uh, but the, that's not the sort of optimal color that Merleau-Ponty is in, uh, interested in. The optimal color Merleau-Ponty is interested in is there whether you ever get that experience or not. That is, whether you ever get the color in the best conditions, the, the optimal color is there in the background drawing you to get the optimal experience and to not be satisfied without it and feel the tension. Whether you ever get it head on, whether you ever get the optimal color in the other sense. Now, I could read you passages, and, it, and I, if Sean doesn't, I will, in which you can see that Merleau Ponty it seems to be confused about this, in that sometimes he seems to, I think he is confused about it. Sometimes he's, well, look, look at 370 and 371. There's a place where you can see it. Where he seems to say that the optimal is the maximum richness, whereas I just read you the passage from 356 where he says the optimal is the color is always in the background. Okay, but there's the real color. Yeah. Maybe there's a distinction between the real color, which yeah. is in the background, versus right. the optimal color, which is just kind of... Well, interesting. Keep your eye open for that. I think, though, the real color is the same as the optimal color in one... I think optimal color is itself ambiguous. I think the optimal color is the name for what's pulling you toward uh, lack of any tension. But it's also the name for what you get when you, what you see when you get to the place where there's no tension. But I, I'm, you're right, I'm only claiming this. But w look at, he, here's the place on 371 where it's clear that the, the optimal is the maximum grip. But, but look at this, how confusing it is. Well, Rick, just what you're saying, and what I would want to say too. He says, I run through appearances and reach the real color or the real shape when my experience is at its maximum. See how that, I mean, that messes up what you just said. Well, no, because the experience is at the maximum. But it's, it's I see, that's what you want to say. Ah, I see, that's what you want to say. Good, let me go on. So the experience will reach a, a degree of clarity, a maximum richness. And then that will be a culmination, an optimum balance. I'm just skimming through the paragraph. It's my full coexistence with the phenomenon at the moment in its maximum articulation. Okay, that's... But then, no, that is the problem. Because he's calling that the real color. And that real color is this maximum clarity story, right? But notice we're now on 356. But the color doesn't get clarity. The color is just there. It's just real. You get a clear or less clear experience of the color. Okay, but you, I see, you get a maximum experience of the color when, well, when there's no tension and so forth. There's a minimum tension. Okay, like no but, the, the, but the real color is not... The real color is, is the best passage is all, all I originally wanted to do was correct you from the previous passage yeah. where it said real color and yeah. you said optimal. Oh, I see. Text well, but there's a lot in there. It says real color, right. And that the real color, and I, you think that that's not the same as the optimal. But here on top of 371, the real color is I'm not my sure. experience. I'm not sure. I'm just yeah, you, okay. Here's an example in favor of Rick's reading. Yeah. Um, consider that there's more than one situation in which you might reach zero tension with the tie. If you're buying the tie to wear to work and there's lots of of windows in your office, so you get lots of natural light. You want to take it outside to see what color it is, but if you're buying it to wear to dinner parties where you're going to be indoors all the time, the tension will be at zero when you're in the store. No. No, I mean, no, 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 no. That would get, that would get to trump the impersonal body schema. Well, no, it'll, be, it'll be impersonal because anyone 
who is, you know, the So it has to be anyone, not just anyone in the store or out. There's one level at which, and maybe it's wrong, but the body schema has built into it a sense of what the optimal color is, and even if you never experience it, you're experiencing all these deviations from it. Now, I submit, we have to stop it, I mean, and you keep your eyes open now in this chapter, but I submit that, that, that he's confused in a way that's not horrible, as long as you keep it straight, between two senses of the real color. What you experience when there is no tension, and you have an, op and you have an optimal grip, could be called the real color. Or, what gives you a sense of wherever you are, vis-a-vis -vis the optimal grip, could be called the real color. And even if you never experience it, it's what you are always experiencing yourself as either far from, or near from, or at. And that could be something you never experienced. Both are there. And both, me, just keep in mind the phenomenon. It's true that some optimal color is guiding you impersonally all the time, whether you ever see it or not. And you can call that the real color in the background. Or some color is the color you get when you get the best lighting conditions and, and distance conditions and everything that your impersonal body schema knows are the right ones. And then you see a color. You could call that the real color. I think that it's more interesting to call the real color the thing in the background that you never need to experience because that's what's doing the impersonal job. That's, what's, that's what the body schema is operating off of and giving you. The other is just good luck if you happen to see it when you need it, to see it in its best. Okay, now you're, now you're prepared to read this chapter on the thing looking for these important questions. That's it. Have a good vacation. Yeah. I have one question.